Hey Jules, what's going on kid? Yeah, on a little late. They wouldn't let me. I had to do it like three times. It finally came on. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I hope it doesn't cut off. <laughs> I hope it doesn't cut off. We'll see. How's things? The usual. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, girl. Okay. Good. Upright and taking in, well, I'm upright. I'm not taking in nourishment. I've been fasting since Sunday. So, yeah, interesting. It's interesting, I must say. Hey, Lynette, how are you? We'll give everybody a few minutes to uh, jump on. I will be doing uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, verses 15 uh, through 33. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, um, I don't know. There was some things happening and uh, some things that could happen. And so, I, I don't know. It just, it just came on me and I said, okay, I'm going to fast for, you know, I'm going to try to go until, until, uh, Sunday, Sunday to Sunday, and uh, just water and tea in the morning. That's it. So, if I, I do it, so this is my one, two, third, three and a half days, fourth day almost. Um, the first day was the toughest, without a doubt. The first day was the toughest. Today has not been too bad. Not bad at all. So, we'll see. We'll see. I've been praying a lot, you know. Reading a lot. Meditating a lot. Uh, I used to, years ago, I used to, um, once a year, I would always fast for a week. And, uh, but I haven't done that in 15, 16 years, maybe. Maybe more. Maybe since I've been in Florida, I haven't done it. Um, I don't know. It just, I don't know. There were some things happening, and I was really praying about this one thing. And, and uh, I said, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast. I'm gonna fast. So we'll see. I may not, ever, I may not get that far, but um. <laughs> you think it would be easier, huh? Riding the bike. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. It's all good. It's all good. I, I think it's, um, I don't know, I think it does something to you spiritually too, is, is, is not just physically, I think it's, you know, and we see lots of instances in uh, scripture where it talks about fasting. And uh, even though uh, New Testament believers are not uh, specifically called to fast, um, I do think it has a place in our spiritual life. So I just decided I was going to do it. So, you know, God puts something on your heart. You just kind of, you just kind of do it. So we'll see how far I get. If I get the, the, the extreme hunger or the blinding headache, then that's going to be the end of it. So you do have to listen to your body, but 
Uh, let's see. What do we got? 13. Uh, let's give it a couple more minutes. See a few people jumping on. Uh, so 7.15, we'll get started. Yeah, it was crazy. I was trying to log on. Kicked me out. I was trying to log on again. Kicked me out. Hey, Jackie, how are you? How are you? How are you, John? Nice to see you guys. Nice to see you guys. A uh, couple more minutes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, guys. 1, 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to finish up this chapter. Um, we'll get back into um, our reading on Sunday in John. Yes, I did get a haircut. I, in more ways than one, I've been scalped. Yes. <laughs> I scalped some pounds and I scalped some hair. <laughs> yes. Yep. I sure did. I try to I try to go once a month. They just you know, I can't be I can't be bothered with it. You know, cuz now ever since I, the older I'm getting and the more gray that I'm getting it doesn't, like it used to lay down. It won't lay down anymore. It just, it just goes high. It just like a like an afro or something. I don't know. It just won't. It won't lay down. So I just said, you know what? I'm really done trying to impress anybody. So <laughs> I just cut it off. Three on top, one on the side. That's it. It it literally takes five minutes for a haircut. Literally. They are unruly. Sometimes gray-haired people are unruly also. But that's another story. <laughs> you, you say that in jest, but I used to have one back in the day. A long one. I used to have a long ponytail, like down the middle of my back. <laughs> You're not going there, Julie. Unruly gray-haired people. I'm I'm becoming one of them, so you know. <laughs> um, I, I did notice this time when I got my haircut, there was there was a lot more gray. I mean, there, like not just a little, a lot. I, I have sneaking suspicion it's all gonna go gray. Which is fine. I don't care. All right. Are we ready? I guess we're ready. Anybody else is going to have to start from the beginning. Okay. So um, I told you about Sunday. Uh, we're going to go back in to John. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. It should be very uh, exciting. Uh, make sure you guys are joining us then. Tonight we're going to be doing 1 Corinthians 10. So let's go ahead and uh, dive right in. Let's start off with a little, <clears throat> with a little prayer, and then we will uh, get into our reading for tonight. Father, we do come before you tonight as your people with open hearts and open minds, Lord, to hear your word, to have it minister to us. That, Lord, we need to be closer to you in all aspects. Lord, may we learn to put you first, to seek your kingdom, and knowing that all other things will line up after it. Teach us what we need to know tonight. Lord, minister to us as only you can. We'd ask for prayers for all those that are here or that will be here. We ask for prayers for those who are just battling. Linda is just battling that cancer. Lynette is just battling the cancer. Lord, we have spiritual deficiencies in our lives where we're just people around us. They're just, they seem like they've lost all understanding of reason. Father, give us that peace that only you can. May we always have that peace and that understanding in our life that no matter what happens, you are enough. So be with us here tonight as only you can. It is in Christ's name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, Paul, how are you? Lisa, would you? Awesome. Glad you guys made it on. I know I was, I was late coming on because it's kept throwing me on and off and everything. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, so 1 Corinthians, you just missed opening prayer. I don't know if you were on or not. Uh, we're going to do uh, 1 Corinthians 10. 
we're going to start out in verse 15 and go all the way to the end. So that's uh, verse 33, all right? And I did send this out in the email, all right? Paul, I don't know if you let me know. Are you getting the email? I put in your your email address. I don't know if it's working. Oh, awesome. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Awesome, awesome. I'm glad everybody's here. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. Now, remember where we left off last week. Let's go back up to verse uh, 14, all right, where he says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Even if we wanted to back up into verse 13 a little bit, where he says he doesn't give us too much that we're overtaken, right? But he, he makes a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So when we're in Christ, we're walking it with him, right? No matter what happens in our lives, there's always a way that Christ, uh, it, his grace is sufficient for us that he, we walk through those things in a different way, right? That's what he, in verse 14, therefore flee idolatry. That means that we stick close to Christ, that we have no other gods but him, that we don't let other things we don't let that thing be put in the number one slot, right? This thing is overwhelming my life, and I'm just focused on that. That's what idolatry is in one form, right? Is that when we look at something that's happening to us, and it overwhelms everything else, or shuts everything else out, and our total, like, we're worried about it, you know, we're on it, we're constantly thinking about it. So that becomes our idol. And what we re need to realize is that when we put God in that place, yeah, this thing is happening, whatever it is, but God is in control of it. So our focus is always on him. Our focus, we're always leaning towards that, right? All those verses fit together, all right? Now, verse 15, he says, I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. You know, thank you. Thank you. Everybody's commenting about their God. <laughs> Got it all cut off, man. Yeah, yeah. Trimmed it right down. So, a foolish person will run back to the world or allow the world to overwhelm them spiritually and physically. Where a wise person, as he's talking about in 15 here, verse 15, I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. He goes, look at the people around you. How do they go through life? How do they get through things? Those who are connected or abiding in Christ, as we see in John 15, those people walk differently than those who are just too muddled in the world, right? There's too much of that happening there. Verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion, communion of the body of Christ? See where he's going with this? We partake of those things, all right? And, and you know, it's interesting because I think, you know, um, I was talking about this uh, where it talks about earlier in, this, <clears throat> earlier in this chapter where it says that the Hebrews, they all partook of the spiritual uh, food. They all partook of the spiritual drink, yet most of them didn't walk pleasing to God. And in fact, he, he, he let them die out before he moved them into the, uh, the rebellious ones, let them die out before he moved into the promised land. So this is kind of going on the same thing when Paul is going, hey, listen, don't you take communion? Don't you understand what that means? You partake of it, you digest it, it becomes a part of you. That's what communion is supposed to be, communion, coming into a union, right? Us and God coming into a union. That's what that means. Now, Verse 17, for we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread, that bread being Christ. I am the bread of life, as Christ said, right, in me. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. All those things are connected and we understand it. But yet, when we're in it, when we're doing it, we feel so close to God. But yet, when life starts hitting us, what happens? What happens? It tries to push us away from God. And what Paul is trying to, to, to tell him, he says, look, remember who you are. Remember, 
remember who God is, right? Matthew 26, verse 26, where he says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, he blessed it and broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Can't get the remission of sins without Christ. Can't get to heaven without Christ, right? We now understand that. So, is it only to get to heaven? No, right? The abundant life that Christ is talking about is for this life also. So therefore, when we are partakers of the spiritual food, partakers of the spiritual drink, right? Then we, ha we are abiding in Christ. No matter what gets thrown at us, no matter how overwhelmed overwhelming those circumstances seem is anything too big for God is anything too big for your Lord and Savior is anything out of his purview that he can that he can control no scripture tells us that all things all things hey Louis all things were put under his 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 control right all things now let's move on verse 18 he says, observe Israel, after the flesh are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. Think of it like this. You partake of these things as a sign and a symbol that you are his. It's like baptism, right? It's an outward expression that you are Christ's but all those around us, right? That's what it means. Well, in the same aspect, when you take the bread and the, and the cup, right? What Paul is saying is there, that's what, that, that's what brings you into that circle where God is. And we are all a part of that, right? We're all a part of that. We all partake of it. That's why I always say, you know, if you have two believers, two believers, two Christians, um, and they're having a dispute, they should be able to settle that without a doubt. If they're both believers, because that takes all the pride out of the whole situation, uh, I say should, because many times that's not the way it is. Uh, the flesh absolutely comes out. Absolutely. Now, verse 19. Verse 19. What am I saying then? that an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything he's drilling down on this thing right what's an idol listen um <clears throat> we know that god talks about there you know you should only you should worship the one true god but does that mean that there are no other gods don't i don't want to lose you here think what he's saying here you can make anything a god People can make anything a God, and they do, and they do. What the Lord is saying here is, make sure you're only worshiping the one true God, me. That's what he's telling us. Paul is saying, is an idol anything? Can it, can it do anything? Can it speak? Can it change anything? No, I can't do anything like that. Verse 19, oh, I'm sorry, verse 20. He says, rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Okay. In a bigger picture, the world, society, you know, our, our, whatever, we see it all throughout, you know, the world says it's okay. Our society says it's okay. Social media says it's okay. But yet when we come back to the same understanding, what they do is not what we do. What they do is not what we do. They're not partakers of this. Right? Let's, let's see if we can get a little more understanding out of this. Let's go forward into 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 13. 
I'm sorry, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 15. And he says, and what accord has Christ with Beal? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The world should not be telling the church what is right. The church should be living the right way, and therefore, through the example, showing the world what it truly means to love, to believe, to have God in our lives. Unfortunately, most of the church today has lost their way. Hey, Star, how are you? Most of the church today, you know, you know I preach about this all the time. You know, they're not giving the word. They don't, they don't read from the Bible. They don't teach from the Bible, you know. Uh, they're, they're too busy with culture wars and, you know, uh, litigation, uh, you know, that, that has no place. Politics has no place. That, that, what did Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. And we need to start remembering that. We need to start remembering that. And if we start loving people, right, love God, love others, cardinal rules, if we start loving people, that's when change happens. That's when change happens. So, too often, we get so mixed up, right, in what's going on in the world, in government, in whatever, society, social media, whatever it may be. Remember what he says here. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Love it. Love it. Be separate, or as we understand it, sanctified. That's what being sanctified means, being separated from. You're separated from the world. Even Jesus talks about it in John 17 when he says, you know, I've they walk in the world, but I've called them to be separate, called them away. When we see holy in the Bible, most times holy is referring to being separated for a specific purpose. In other words, Israel was God's holy nation, all right? And what that means is he separated them for a purpose. That's what that holy means when you start looking into the understanding is it's not perfect, it's not ideal, it's not without sin, otherwise it wouldn't it would have never it would have never been attached to Israel, right? Okay. Let's get that. Now, let's go back into our text here, verse 23. He says. I'm sorry, we didn't do 22. Let's do 22. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Interesting. If we worship idols, what did, what did God say? I'm a jealous God. You shall have no other gods before me. You, you shall worship no one but me. Interesting. What if you make God jealous? What then? Good question, huh? It's a good question. Verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Hmm. I can do whatever I want. You can drink. You can smoke. Those are lawful. Are they good? Do they edify? Do they lift up? Or do they tear down, destroy our bodies, which is a temple for God? I mean, a lot of people struggle with alcohol. He says, put this barometer on it, no matter what it is. 
if it's helping and edifying or teaching or coming into understanding or lifting up, then it's good. But just because something you can do something doesn't always mean you should do that. Think about it. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do it. Again, come back from where we started. Partakers of the cup, partakers of the bread, communion with God. It's about him and his rules, not the world. And just because the world says it's okay doesn't mean God says it's okay. If, if a million people say that it's one way and God says it's another, who is right? I heard you say it. God, every time, every time he is right. Verse 24, he says, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Well, that puts a whole different spin on it. You mean when I do something, I have to take into account of how this is going to affect others? Absolutely you do. And we'll, we can go back from the very beginning when God is talking, right? But God, ex all right. In the very beginning, right? After Adam and Eve fell, right? What happened? There's two brothers and God's talking to them. And remember what he says. He, when he's questioning the older brother, what does he say? And his brother, and he says, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, somehow that negates all of our responsibility that we should think about others as well as ourselves, right? So are you your brother's keeper? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are your brother's keeper. Here it is right here in black and white. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. I can do this, but if I do it, it's going to cause some trouble or damage. So therefore, I'm not going to do it. Because that's not edifying, that's destroying, that's tearing down. That's the place I don't want to go and I don't want to be responsible for other people struggling. Somebody comes to your house for dinner, you want to have wine, they used to have a problem with drinking. You would never, ever, ever, ever serve it. Right? Exactly, Star. Because you never want to cause your brother to stumble. And think about that in other aspects of life, too. Right? You don't want to cause, you're not causing people to stumble or people to be outraged by a position that you take. Remember, when someone is falling, when someone has, is not a part of the sheepfold, how do we deal with them? Gentleness, loving, understanding. And when we don't do that, you might as well spit right in God's eye. Verse 25. Verse 25. Eat whatever is sold in the market asking no questions for conscience sakes, but the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Beautiful understanding here. Some people like to say Satan's the, the ruler of this world and God's taken his hands off of it. That is absolutely untrue. This verse helps us under the, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. God has not taken his hands off of here. He allows us because we are created as well as the angels that were created to have free will to choose right to choose your path to choose who you are inside he doesn't want robots that's not what god was doing right so any intelligent person intelligent being that was created by god was also given the ability to choose right from wrong Let's look. <laughs> Let's look into 1 Timothy 4. And he's talking exactly, exactly about some people that we see today. 
1 Timothy 4, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. We've got a whole bunch of people saying they're church people, acting like they're not church people. They have departed from the faith. Now, are they then not saved? We know through a mountain of scripture, that once we are saved, that God then is the holder or the seal of that. Ephesians 1.13 explains this in more detail, where he says that he has put his seal upon us. He's the guarantee of our inheritance or what's happening. So when you look at these verses, you have to look at them in context of scripture as a whole. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Could it be that they were trying to walk in the faith and, and never had it, and then allow themselves to be pulled in different directions because they were without substance and, and foundation? Yes, could be. Scripture also tells us that even the elect will be deceived if possible. Even the elect will be deceived, if possible. So what does that tell us? That even believers, when they don't stay grounded in a foundational understanding of what it means, the bread, what it means, the cup, what it means to be in, in Christ, that we lose that ability to love and understand and be gentle with others, then we're going right back to where we don't belong. Doctrines of demons. We talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago. That's how it fits in perfectly. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Oh, here we go again. So, this sanctification issue is coming up not only with people, but also with creation. Interesting. It's like, you know, I was talking about, you know, Jesus when he died on the cross and all the things that happened there. And one of them was that, you know, there were great earthquakes and the ground shook and rocks split and all that. And so what we come to realize is one thing, that creation had a response to the creator dying, right? There was, there was a, a, a big response from it. But those who he was dying for were the ones calling for his blood. But creation does not see it like that. And that's what Paul's trying to say. It's like, the Lord is, you know, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. Everything is, when it, you can be, you accept that with thanksgiving, and everything is clean by the sanctification process. That's how we get sanctified. That's how we get cleaned, through the sanctification process. When, when Jesus broke the bread, he, what did he do first? He blessed it sanctification process when he was feeding the 5,000 what's the first thing he did he held the food to the sky but and blessed it. he said father bless this too often we lose we lose that understanding verse 27 if any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. Too often, we go places we shouldn't go, right? Um, if you're going in the midst of unbelievers, and we are called to do that, there's no, there's no problem with that. You're not to be, right? But what we need to realize is that if we openly start attacking people for some things that they probably don't even understand what they're doing, 
they're not believers. They don't have that knowledge. Then we just drive them away from any kind of understanding of who God is. And they will, they'll walk away saying, is that? I don't want no part of a God like that. So now here is God being blasphemed because of your actions. Now, you know when you go places, there's going to be things that happen that don't line up with you. You know that. Verse 28. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and, the con and, and for conscience sakes, for the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. So, we call this having discernment. Okay? We have discernment in situations. Or at least we should have discernment in some situations. But too often, we let ourselves get carried away. The crowd that was there yelling for Jesus to be crucified for his blood, you think all of them were in this? Or was it just a few people speaking loudly and they all got caught up in the moment? We've all been there. We've all gotten caught up in a moment before. Interesting. Verse 29. Verse 29. Conscience, I say not your own, but that for the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? Boils it down. Again, I'm not going to do this if it's going to offend this person, my brother, because I don't want him to stumble. But what am I, why am I not doing it when I feel that it's okay? There's plenty of things we can attach this to in the world. You know, I don't see an issue with this. Somebody else might see an issue with it. Let's get some further understanding of what Paul's talking about here. Let's go to Romans 14, verse 14. He says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. You see, it's caught, it will cause damage to him spiritually. He has decided in his heart, that may change in his mind, that this is not right. So if he does it what, is it, what does he get overwhelmed with? Guilt, right? I shouldn't have done that. Even though someone else came to the understanding that it's fine. So what is our reaction to this? When we have, especially young believers, struggling with situations. Look at verse 15. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food, the one for whom Christ died. And it could be other things besides food, right? We are to bring people along. Their understanding will grow. We gently and, and, and with, with love and grace explain without being critical about whatever the issue is. Verse 16, therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Oh. Amen, Lord. Too often we're hitting people over the head with our Bible and thinking we're doing something great for God when all we're doing is driving away the people we're supposed to be reaching. Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is, is acceptable to God and approved by men. We learn how to deal with people the way that we should then God's love can shine through. But if we're just going to take a hard line, right, no matter what it is, then what are we really doing? What are we telling that person? You don't matter, right? This issue is bigger than you, and you need to conform. Does that work? Does that ever work? 
No, because what does it do? What does it do? It plants the seed of rebellion in their heart. The one thing that we never want to do, the one thing you never want to do is stir up rebellion. We want to stir up good works. We want to stir up kindness, stir up joy and peace, right? And so we just, we, we, take, a, we take a hatchet to it when we think it's something that's outside of, the, of, our, of what we believe is right. Who says you got it all together? Who says you know it all? There's plenty of things that I, when I was younger in, in my faith, that I believed it was one way, and then God showed me it's not. And I had to change my understanding. Why are you damaging your brother about something that just because you feel is the correct thing? They need to walk their walk. They need to grow and, and, and come into faith and understanding in the same way you did. So give them grace to do that. Let's go back into our text. Verse 30. But if I partake with thanks, why am I, why I evil spoken of for the food? Hmm? Let me read that again. I got some glare. It's terrible. <clears throat> but if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I gave thanks? Okay. Again, be aware who's around, what's happening, what is your setting, what is, right? Absolutely, that's why God sent Jesus. Absolutely. And, and so if we keep our focus on that, but it's about Jesus, right? And that we want to help. Again, if we go up all the way back up to verse 20, you know, 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each seek the other's well-being. I don't know how many times we have to recite this. It's not about us, but it's about us. And, and so we're all connected. We're all part of one another. When we hurt one, we hurt them all. You know, I mean, it drives me crazy when I see people that are supposedly walking in the love of God just bashing their fellow man left and right. That is just not acceptable under any circumstance. I don't care what the issue is. You could be totally right about an issue. And if you go about it the wrong way, you're totally wrong, period, period. And you're losing whatever point that you wanted to make because of the way you're putting it out there. Don't do it. Don't do it. Verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or, whether you, uh, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You see, that's where he's expanding it. And he's telling us this is more about food and drink. Right? It's more about characters, more about heart. It's more about who you are down deep. It's more about you know how you connect to others and how we expand the kingdom of God and bring them in or push them away because of the bad job that we're doing with it. The glory of God. Love it. 32. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Thank you, Jesus. Give no offense. I guess people don't really read these verses, I guess. I don't understand how you can, how you can go through or you can read this and then act the way that you do and then say you're a godly person. I don't, I don't get it. I really I don't understand it. Verse 33. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. What is our overwhelming understanding that Jesus sent us to what? Bring people to him. And if our actions and the way that we're presenting God is driving people away, no matter who they are, then we're wrong. And we need to stop that. We need to stop that immediately. Romans 15, verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak 
and not to please ourselves. Hmm. Let that one sink in. Let that one sink in. You have somebody that's maybe emotional, emotionally fragile. They're having a tough time dealing with life. You're saying, you know, grow up, be a man, be a woman, do the right thing. The problem is, the problem is, we don't know what underlying weakness is driving them or insecurities that are driving them to this, right? And when we don't take that into account, when we don't take that into account, then it's all about us and ourselves and not about them. Again, Romans 15, 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who were approached fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope and understanding and learn how to walk this life in a way that is pleasing to God and not the way that the Hebrews did in the, in the wilderness with a rebellious heart, with a prideful heart that was all about them and not considering what their fellow man and fellow brother is going through. You see, that's what it truly means to partake of the, of the bread, to partake of the drink. To be in communion with God and to understand his heart and the way that he dealt with people in loving kindness always, no matter what they were doing, in deep sin he caught people in. Was there ever a harsh word? Was there, was there, never. Why do we do it then? If you're gonna, if you're gonna be there for people, you have to be there in the right way. Otherwise, you're just there for yourself, right? You're just there trying to condemn people and trying to, you know, force them out, force them down and, and to conform to what you believe is right. Teach them God's word the way it's written. You don't have to be like that. Let God do the work. For conscience sake, Paul talks about. Let God work on them. That's his job. It's not yours. And too often we, we, we try to do God's job. You know, what, what do I like to say? You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a humbling understanding when you realize two things. One, there's only one God. And two, you're not him. Yes, and remember where you came from. That's always what Paul's message always was. Remember where I came from. Uh, who? Me. A horrid man, wretched man that I am. Chief among sinners, you know? He always, he always remembered that. You know, I was a mess at one time. I thought I was doing God's work, but I absolutely wasn't. And I think today, too many believers that are in churches, especially around here, think they're doing God's work, when in fact they are not. They are not, because in the way they're trying to proclaim God's word and to help others who don't know it, it's just driving them away and putting a big wedge between God and them people, and those people. And that should not be. That should not be. All right. Anyway. Thank you, Lord. I did tell you I was I was fasting. <laughs> yeah, so I'm on like a four-day fast already. And uh, yeah, I did a lot of reading, a lot of praying. And uh, yeah, interesting. Interesting. God, God's showing me some things. So it's good. It's all good. Yes, grace, give grace to those who hear. Yes, absolutely. When we learn to deal with people on the outside of the faith, right, as Peter talked, talked about and Paul talked about in great detail, then we realize what it truly means to be in God. Because God came to people where they were, who they were, and the circumstances they were to draw them out of the circumstance gently, not to force them, not to legislate them. Not to, we got to get off of this. And we have to get away from that. All right, let's go ahead and pray. All right, I'll let you guys go rant over. 
<laughs> uh, thank you guys for all being here tonight. Uh, we always have a great time. Uh, we always get a lot of understanding out of God's word, as always. Uh, be praying about our jail ministry uh, Friday nights and Sunday nights. Uh, be with us here on Sunday morning, back to regular time, 1030. All right. And, uh, you know, I hope to see you guys all online. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we understand that to be your people means to be connected to you and then express those ways and characteristics to others around us, always keeping in mind that their interest is our interest. And we need to be gentle and understanding about it, even though it's something that we find distasteful that's happening. Father, teach us to be humble in heart. Teach us to show the grace that you have shown us. Teach us to be there for people in the midst of their battle, all the while being strong not to be drawn into it. We know that you fight for us and that your love conquers all things. So, Father, let us use that to battle the things of this world, your love. So we do thank you for this time. It was an amazing thing that you did tonight. And we, as always, Lord, it's all about you. So we thank you again. In Christ's name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen, amen. Yes. Yes, Star. I agree with that very much. All right, y'all. I will see you on Sunday.